Hi friends! My name's Jordan and you're watching Criminal Crafting. I wanted to get it right Trying to find some balance in my life I never really put up Thank you everyone for being here. If you're new here, thank you for coming to my channel. I hope that you will subscribe and stick around. Subscribing really helps out my channel so I can continue to make videos for all of you. If you're a returning subscriber, Thank you, thank you, thank you for subscribing. It means the world to me. Like, seriously, it means everything to me. And I am so thankful for you guys every single day. I love the relationships that I've made with a lot of you. You are all wonderful, and I appreciate you. Here on Criminal Crafting, we talk about all things true crime, court cases, missing persons, old cases, new cases. We talk about everything. We also craft. But we did move that to a separate channel called Geo and Dan, and I will link it down below. You guys, today's story, I have recorded this about a hundred times. <laughs> and something's happened every time. Either the audio gone out, the audio not working great. I recorded it when I first started recording videos, and it was an awful video. I've re <laughs> this is like my 10th time recording it. So hopefully this one is good. But this story is a very personal story to me, as you can tell by the title. But yeah, let's get into it. So we will get to my side of things and how it pertains to me. But I want to do a little backstory about my stalker. We're going to talk about a sweet little girl named Destiny Norton. Destiny's parents came from a very hard life. Rachel Norton was born in Utah, moved out of state, then back to Utah. Rachel was abused as a child and spent most of her childhood in and out of foster care and group homes and those kinds of places. Ricky, Destiny's dad, was raised in Texas and came to Utah at 16 through Job Corps, but quickly dropped out. Neither of them finished high school. On Rachel's 19th birthday, she had a huge birthday party and Ricky ended up attending this birthday party. And from that point on, they were inseparable. Destiny was born November 3rd of 2000 and had a sister born in July of 2004. Destiny's mom, Rachel, was pregnant with their third little girl when the couple got married. Rachel and Ricky got married July 8th, 2006. And remember the date because it's so important to the story. On July 16th, just eight days after they got married, Destiny Norton went missing. Rachel at the time was eight and a half months pregnant with her third baby girl. Destiny was described as a happy, sweet, five-year-old with blonde hair and green streaks in her hair. She had green eyes and she had silver cap teeth. She disappeared wearing her mother's gray shirt with black stripes. The evening of July 16th, Destiny got in a fight with her parents because she took a bath and then she was supposed to go to bed and she didn't want to go to bed. So she went outside to their backyard. They lived in Salt Lake City, Utah in a small ranch type home with her parents and sister and about 10 other couples and friends. They shared it for economic reasons. They had a shared yard with other homes, including a man named Craig Gregerson. And I'll get into that part later. Destiny's parents went out to get Destiny. And when they went out, they couldn't find her. They ended up calling 911 at 8.41 p.m. I can't even imagine what was going through Destiny's parents' heads at that time. I mean, for me to have just fought with my child and then go outside and go out to get them and then be nowhere to be found, I would be running crazy all over the neighborhood trying to find my child. And I can only imagine that they did the same thing. Over 5,000 volunteers, police, and FBI searched for eight days for Destiny. Destiny's body was found 100 feet away on July 24th, 2006 at 8 30 p.m in the basement of their neighbor 20 year old craig gregerson when destiny went missing detectives went door to door in the neighborhood they interviewed gregerson inside his home 
but police say canines never picked up Destiny's scent. Even though Gregerson refused to allow police to search his home, the police chief says that is not sufficient probable cause to search someone's home. They had to wait for a warrant. So what I understood from that was Craig let them search his upper floor, but refused to let them search his basement. And because the canines didn't pick up on anything, they had to wait for the warrants to be able to search his basement, and they didn't have warrants at the time. The night before they found her, two tips came in around the same time. One was info leading them to Gregerson, and the other was a witness who supposedly saw Destiny in a black pickup truck outside a convenience store in Farmington, Utah. The Farmington lead turned into nothing. On July 24th, 2006, Craig went in to meet with the FBI voluntarily to do a polygraph test. He ended up confessing there at the meeting. Craig told FBI that he had been planning her abduction for quite some time and that he had written plans for the crime. Craig told them he lured Destiny into his home and Destiny wanted to leave and became very vocal. So he put his hand over her mouth and squeezed tightly until she went limp and he laid her on the floor. He later picked her up and brought her down to his basement and did horrible things and then put her body in a bin with a lid and hid it behind a bunch of bins. He went and bought cleaning supplies to mask the smell as well. Police later said that the container wasn't easily accessible because the basement was messy and packed with stuff. Some of the neighbors said, we're sick. This is right behind the wall of my house to have her missing and have her turn up just two doors down and we didn't even know she was there. Here's a little about Craig's past. Craig grew up in Orem, Utah. One of his brothers came out after all of this and said that he was always kind of a lazy guy. Craig married Catherine and had a little girl. At the time of Destiny's disappearance, Craig and Catherine were separated. They weren't living together. Court documents for Craig painted him as an abusive husband. He worked as a Radio Shack warehouse clerk at the time. Allegedly, while he was with Catherine, he kicked and punched her, once causing a miscarriage. It definitely was a troubled marriage. His mother-in-law filed an affidavit accusing Craig of once choking and punching her when she tried to kick him out of her home. He was convicted of assault in December 2004 for punching his mother-in-law in the face. Craig once threw the couple's one-year-old child across a bed when the infant kicked some food off of his lap. The attorney detailed those allegations in a court filing in court in March, opposing a protective order Craig had obtained against his wife, Catherine. A judge revoked the order and dismissed Craig's hand-scrawled complaints, which the attorney called fabricated. According to the papers, Craig told his wife he didn't care if he killed her, that it would be better to be in jail than living with her. Papers stated Catherine is a battered wife who put up with it because he loved him and felt a need for his love. How sad is that? To feel like you need someone who hurts you to love you. So you, put, you continue to put up with it. Just breaks my heart for her. Witnesses for Destiny's case said they saw Craig's wife several times near the house prior to his arrest, including the night of his arrest. A family friend of the Norton said, she came up last night, the night of the arrest, and said, oh, where's my husband? She said Craig's name, and the neighbor said, you need to go. He was just arrested for murder. And they said, Catherine didn't even act surprised. Craig's wife felt that her husband had been set up. She said that she thought someone was setting him up. Unless she heard it straight from him, she didn't believe it. He also claimed she had no knowledge of this until she walked up to the house the night of the arrest. She helped with the search efforts. So did Craig in the days following Destiny's disappearance. She was in the home the day prior to the arrest and didn't notice anything unusual. She was asked if she smelled anything in the home. She said, you know what? The house smelled like it normally does. She didn't smell a single thing. I've been in that house several times since she was missing and I haven't smelled a single thing. And if he killed her, I will not stand by him, no doubt in my mind. 
She said she never went into the basement. She said her husband voluntarily let police check her, his house on Monday. He agreed to the main floor, but not to the basement. She said Craig was sick the few days prior to his arrest. He agreed to the polygraph and never came back from the meeting with the FBI. She said prior to the and this, he had only minor trespassing brushes with law in high school. And that we will get to, too. Destiny's family and friends were initially outraged after the search ended and accused authorities of mishandling the investigation. They were upset at police and said they did not do their jobs, that it took too long to find her body. Destiny's uncle believes police betrayed his trust, but credits him for bringing an end to the mystery of her disappearance. An apology on behalf of the family and friends was later issued in a press conference. I believe the reason that they were so upset was because they felt like she was so close, police should have been able to get the warrant and find her quicker than they did. That they knew that she probably was with Craig and police didn't act quicker, but they went as quick as they could in getting warrants. And so the family was upset and later apologized for being upset. Police say they didn't have enough probable cause for a warrant and the Norton family never identified Craig as a suspect. In fact, neighbors barely saw him. He kept to himself. A neighbor said, the only time I hung out with him is when he was standing here talking to the FBI and he lied right to our faces. He looked right at us and said, I wish I knew where she was. Can you imagine? Craig was charged on July 27th, 2006 with aggravated murder and kidnapping. In a plea bargain to avoid the death penalty, he pleaded guilty to capital murder and child kidnapping and was sentenced to life in prison without parole for the murder and 15 years to life for the kidnapping. In court, Craig gave the family handwritten notes apologizing. The handwritten notes and the trespassing all kind of intertwines into my story and what happened to me. So when I was in elementary school, I was in about fifth grade at the time, and Craig was a year older than me. He lived across the street and, and down a few blocks from me. And one of his friends was really good friends with us, me and my friends, and so we hung out with them a lot. And Craig was always a very quiet person. He just was kind of shy and quiet, is how I would describe him. But as we got to junior high, I believe I was in eighth grade, and he would have been in ninth. I really liked his friend and found out that Craig liked me. So Craig started doing things like leaving me letters on my doorstep. And these were letters that were like, four or five pages long. And as I read letters that he wrote to the family and that he wrote to the court for his rest restraining order, the way he writes is so specific. You could tell his style of writing anywhere. So reading those letters gave me chills up my arms and spine because they were exactly the kind of letters that he wrote to me. And I wish that I had those letters still, but they were essentially professing his love for me and that he wanted to date me and blah, blah, blah. They were a lot. And I just wasn't interested in, in him that way. And then things kind of progressed to where he was coming and peeking in my window at night, knocking on my window. He kicked out my fence one day with one of his scooters, I think, and would throw snowballs at my window. There was the last night that he ever did any of that kind of stuff. He had thrown a snowball at my window and my brothers took off as fast as they could out the door after them and they never came back. <laughs> so it was, incredibly interesting to hear that he had done this to Destiny. I had a family member reach out to me. At the time, this case was a huge case. Like, like a big case. Everybody knew about it. And at the time, I was 18. And one of my family members reached out to me and said, don't you know this guy? And we looked up the article and 
saw his face and I was like, oh my heck, yeah, that's Craig. And they were like, that's the guy that stalked you, right? And I was like, yes, this is the guy that stalked me. So it was incredibly baffling to see, but to hear about everything that he did over the years with trespassing and then abusing his wife and making his wife have a miscarriage, it all kind of built up to then murdering a child. You know, it's patterns and it's truly devastating and I feel so bad for this family. I just wanted to tell you guys about my own personal stalking story and how my stalker became a murderer and I'm glad that he's behind bars for the rest of his life because that's where he deserves to be. But just kind of crazy when it's someone that was intertwined in your life. But tell me what you guys think. What do you think about the stalking? What do you think about this case? Comment down below. I love chatting with you guys. Like this video and subscribe, please, so that we can continue to make videos for you guys. And until next time, we'll see you later. Bye. <laughs> I wanted to get it right. Trying to find some balance in my life. I never really put up a fight.